Welcome to the latest in our series of In Conversation With. Today we are shining the spotlight on Emma Hammett, who is the founder of First Aid for Life. And First Aid for Life is an award-winning business which is all about providing advice and outstanding first aid training um, to groups and individuals. And in our In Conversation series, we are going to be shining the spotlight on different entrepreneurs, finding out what inspires them, what inspired them to start their business, what drives them, what makes them tick, hear about what they've learned along the way, the big wins, some of the tough times as well. And they're going to share with us some of their best advice as uh, for those of us who may be looking to start our own business as well. And we all know we, we never stop learning. And so it's just fascinating to hear from other business owners and to hear about their own steps along the way and their, their own journey. So great to see that we've got Emma who's about to be joining us. Uh, Emma is the founder of, and uh, she'll be joining us in, in just a minute or two. Last week we were talking to Stephanie Betts, who was the founder of Josephine Home. And here she is, hi Emma. Hello, Sarah. Thank you very much for inviting me to join you. Well, my pleasure. And just to let you know that uh, I can hear you perfectly. I think you can hear me this time. I can certainly hear you. Um, here are the joys of technology. We did a, a sound check uh, just earlier. Everyone could hear Emma, but couldn't hear me. Um, last night, we did a, a tech check and it all worked perfectly. So fingers crossed, everything, everything goes to plan. Um, and so great to have you on board, Emma. Thank you so much for for taking the time out of your very busy day to join us. What I was just explaining is this is our In Conversation series. This is where we shine the spotlight on leading entrepreneurs. And we love to hear from those entrepreneurs within our network. What drove you to start your business? What was your big inspiration? What makes you tick? What you've learned along the way? Delighted if you can share some of your big wins, but also share candidly some of the tough times as well, and some of the advice um, that uh, you'd like to impart to us as well. So if I, I'd like to begin by asking you just to tell me a bit more about First Aid for Life and what was the inspiration for it? Okay, well, thank you. So First Aid for Life is a multi-award winning um, first aid training business. We're fully regulated and our trainers are highly experienced medical health and emergency services professionals. And that's what makes this different. So I started First Aid for Life in 2007, and my background is nursing. So when I was nursing and I was in a &E and also day-to-day -day nursing, um, I saw so many times where prompt and appropriate first aid would have made a massive difference. So for example, I was working in the burns unit and I had a little boy who was really badly burnt, but his mum had no idea that cool running water was the answer for a burn. And when she spilt um, a piping hot cup of coffee over her son, she ran outside screaming and getting help. Meanwhile, he was cooking. So it's that basic. First aid is not complicated. It's simple, it's basic. It saves lives, it prevents scarring. And so, from that moment, it was something that um, I felt very passionate about, that people should be doing and they should, they should learn about. And when I had my first daughter, or my daughter, because I've got a daughter and a son. So when I had my daughter, um, I looked around for a, a first aid course because I felt it was important for me to refresh my skills as well, because it had been a while since, since I'd done my first aid training. And, and your skills do lapse. And I was shocked at the disparity because I don't know if you knew Sarah, but actually you can set up a first aid training company with just a three day first aid at work course. Gosh. So that is all that is needed. And there's some companies that are training parents to be first aiders as a back to work thing to do. And I'm all for back to work things to do, but actually first aid isn't one of them because you really need to have used your skills and have that fundamental knowledge to be able to answer questions appropriately 
and be able to really help someone because these are important skills and you need to be able to get them right. Mm -hmm. So um, that is why I started and that's why I started and, and felt really strongly that I wanted to be partnering with or choosing as my trainers um, medical health and emergency services professionals. So we've got 42 trainers across the country now. I, I couldn't agree with you more. There were so many interesting things that came from that. Is that, I mean, first of all, I think as, you know, as parents, I mean, for, for anyone with children, it's so important to have some basic skills that we know how to respond to something very quickly. Very important to have taken the right sort of course. And, but equally, as you then also point out, that the course that you choose needs to be delivered by people who are genuinely well-trained, properly qualified, and understand what they're doing, um, because otherwise it, you know, it's, it's incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so how did the business evolve from the idea to recognizing what you thought was missing, perhaps you know, in the industry and what was being already provided out there, to then you know, building what is now a multi-award winning business that you know you train thousands and thousands of people every year? Well, it's taken a while. Yeah. <laughs> so initially, as with you know, all businesses, it was me. <laughs> so I was it, I was the admin, I was the trainer, I was, um, I was the marketing person, I was the IT person. Uh, and I'm sure there's lots of people starting off with businesses for which they are in exactly that same boat. And um, I, I work as a, um, or I help as a mentor at the British Library and I work with other um, sort of budding entrepreneurs, helping them on their journal, journey. Uh, and it's, it's really important that um, you think very carefully about what you're going to be doing and ensure it's something that you are passionate about. So, um, I mean, I started this in 2007, so I've had a lot of years of growing, steadily growing. And I think one of the big initial moments when it went from a one-man band to a business is when you start bringing other people on board. Mm -hmm. So when you start valuing your time appropriately, because as a one-man band, it's very easy to think, oh, I can't afford to pay someone to do that. And to then do it yourself. But actually, if you sit down and actually put a figure on the value of your time and what you could be doing with your time if you're using it appropriately and where your skill set is and where, what you're good at and delegate anything else that can be delegated. A, you'll end up with um, a, a, saner, a saner lifestyle B, you'll end up doing stuff that you enjoy more. I mean, I'm really not that great at wading through my inbox. So I've got two fabulous office managers for whom they are, they are superb at just organizing and structuring and making sure that all the operations around the business work as they should do. So that's not the right thing for me to be doing. I can cover it, but it's not the right thing for me to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Likewise, my finance, you know, I can add up, but actually that's not why I do my business. That's not the bit that excites me about it. So I outsource that. Then look at what you are doing, sit down and work out where you are spending your time and then carefully take out the bits that you're not, don't float your boat and concentrate on the other bit. Then you're able to grow, um, grow your business. The other side of it as well is realize that other people can do what you're doing just as well and actually better than you can. So initially it was like, well, I, I'm the only one that can train because I, I, I know how it should be done. Well, that's rubbish. You're never going to scale your business and actually you're never going to bring in the expertise that you need unless you bury your ego and you take on really good people. So my trainers have all got different skill sets, different specialisms, and they are all fabulous trainers. And make sure that you have a really robust interview process. Uh, try not to um, employ friends. I have done that in the past, and sometimes it's worked, and sometimes it hasn't worked so well. It's always easier 
to go on a straight business relationship. And then actually, you know where you are and it, it makes life easier. They can become friends as you work with them, but it is a slightly different working relationship, which, which is healthier, I think. There were so many important lessons in that. That was just absolutely brilliant. And I think for, for anyone that is, is watching and thinking, how do they scale their business to the next stage? There were so many important lessons in there, you know, whether it is being prepared, <coughs> being prepared to outsource things, but as you quite rightly point out, aren't necessarily your strengths or your passion. Um, and also being prepared to let go as and when it feels right and when you have the confidence in, in other people. And so I, I think it's, that's just so fascinating because there'll be so many people watching this who aren't going to go and run a first aid business, but they are in a business where, or they are thinking of launching a business or scaling it up. How do you take it to that point where you are employing other people, recruiting other people and, you know, creating something that is just so much bigger and, and, um, and more impactful. Yeah, it's, it's about, um, as I say, burying your ego, understanding what you're good at and valuing your time. And also ensuring that, I mean, the beauty of a small business is that we are agile. So a lot of small businesses have been hit really hard with COVID, but actually um, we can pivot and we can pivot quite quickly and we can make different decisions far quicker than some of the bigger organizations. So we may not have the resources behind us, but actually we've got quick decision making and we can look for opportunities and we can take those opportunities quickly. Mm. So um, all sorts of things you can, you can look at. So um, look at, so, so again, going back to starting your business, make sure you've done your research. Make sure that what you are doing is that, that there is a market for it. Mm. Uh, and don't just do your research by asking other people because you will have lots of yes people and lots of naysayers. You actually need to do proper research and find out if this is something sensible. Do the same for the price, the pricing, and always go in on quality rather than trying to go in with a, with a deal because people respect quality and quality lasts. So go in as a quality business and, um, and as I say, outsource, build on your expertise. So make sure it is something that you're good at and you're passionate about because you will be doing it a lot. So the idea of your work-life balance um, and having a better work-life balance, running your own business, um, as I'm sure Sarah, you will say as well, is, is, a, is a myth. You, you will be able to manage your time differently. So if you've got a family, yes, you'll be able to go to, you know, post-COVID sports day and, and assemblies and all the things, you know, you won't miss a Christmas play, but you will still have to get that work done. And that might be that you're doing it late in the evening because it doesn't go away. So- I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> so, yeah. so you, need to, you need to balance that and understand what you want to do. So make sure you've, as, as I said, you've, you've done your research, you've got a market um, that it's going to work. And, and look at the touch points as well. So in terms of marketing, look at all the different ways that people are going to come across you. Because research has shown that people need to be exposed to you, oh, multiple times, between sort of seven and 11 times before they're actually ready to buy. So look about where you're turning up. So thank you, Sarah. I'm turning up on the Really Helpful Club now at the moment. So hopefully, Anyone that's listening, if they're then talking to someone who says, oh, I'm looking for a first aid course, will think, oh, there was someone on the Really Helpful Club that did that. And then they still might not be ready. And then maybe something pops up on Facebook or maybe they come across one of my books or they see an article that I've written somewhere. And those different touch points are what reinforce your business and make it more credible and make it more likely that you will end up selling whatever it is that you are selling. And the other thing is, do not be scared of selling. Because in the UK, people think of selling as a dirty word. But actually, selling is what we do to stay in business. 
And if you feel you're being sold to, then actually it's not being done very well. So selling should be the positioning of something that, that you want or that you possibly could want. So there needs to be a buyer need there by someone who's got the right answer to your problems. And it should be customer focused. So make sure, so as our first aid training is tailored to your needs, make sure that whatever product or service you're doing and you're creating, make sure that it is adaptable and it isn't just a straight one size fits, one size fits all, but that it has a bit of personalization in there because people like that. And the other thing is people buy from people. So don't be a faceless organization and don't be frightened about putting yourself out there. You know, Sarah and I are, are not au fait at uh, Instagram Lives. We sat down and we worked it out because we know it's important to get ourselves out there. And if it all goes well, fair, I, I think you're, you're sharing so many great messages here and it's lovely. We've got some great comments coming in. So true, one of the biggest problems we have is most people want quality training but we're not prepared to pay for it you know so, so please do keep sending in the comments it, it's great um great to to um see your response to emma's brilliant advice um so emma difficult question this what have you found the hardest part about setting up your business i think building resilience i think actually realizing that not everyone is your customer that you will have knockbacks along the way, um, that you will have to change. You'll have to look at different things. So something that may, you may have been really passionate and excited about, mm. if it doesn't fly, and if it's not going to, if it's not a good use of your time, and it's not adding to the business, then it has to go. So actually being a little bit, ruthless is a tough, is, is, is harder than I mean, but, but, keeping focused on your core values and making sure that you are branching and expanding. So for example, we started onlinefestaid.com and we started that about ooh, six years ago now. And thank goodness we did. <laughs> yeah. Because without onlinefestaid.com in that first lockdown, we would have had no income at all. So in the second lockdown, Fortunately, because we are a COVID secure business and because um, we are um, running essential training, we are allowed to continue, which is wonderful. But the combination of onlinefirstaid.com and First Aid for Life has meant we can offer a whole variety of different solutions to people looking to train. So right at the start of... Um, of, of lockdown, go slightly off your question, but I'm sort of going on to how we have coped in terms of you asking the tough times. I, well, it's I mean, terribly nothing, important. Nothing has been as tough as this last six months. So in terms of the tough times, as lockdown came, we were approached by McDonald's to ask if we could help them with first aid training for all their managers in UK and Ireland. And of course we could. So we sat down and, or I sat down, because at that point I had no staff <laughs> because they were all furloughed, and wrote a course for McDonald's. And I, we, we put um, nearly a thousand managers um, through that now, uh, which was fantastic. And the same with the Royal College of Chiropractors, because they all needed to um, do first aid training in order to revalidate and and. Um, the Royal College of Chiropractors uh, and, the, and the General Chiropractic Council to, to um, allow them to continue to practice. So it was really important to them, but they, um, they couldn't get onto a course because all the courses were shut. So it was a, a lifesaver for them at that point because they, they had to revalidate um, by the beginning of October. So we wrote that with the Royal College of Chiropractors. And we're now working with the Maudsley Hospital on a really, really exciting um, partnership um, where we are, um, well, I've got, I've got online mental health courses that they love. And now we're working on a blended one, which will work with them and the, the Maudsley um, training team. And they will be bringing in um, actors to do um, both case studies 
and to do simulations um, in order to get a real quality mental health first aid course, um, the likes of which doesn't exist at the moment. So partnerships are so powerful. Mm -hmm. And if you can look at a way of building more power partnerships, um, as Sarah and I have done here, mm -hmm. I'm reaching Sarah's audience and Sarah's reaching mine, mm -hmm. which is, is brilliant. It's brilliant for both of us. As small businesses, we are suddenly doubling, if not tre trebling our, our reach by mm -hmm. um, extending through this because there's people out there who, for whom Sarah's business is of more interest than, than mine, and mine who's, who's, my business is more interest than Sarah's, and they will be talking to each other, which is wonderful news. So I, I work could, with couldn't, agree, couldn't agree with you more. You know, the, I think it's the, the ability to pivot, to adapt, as you say, to be agile, and to reach out and to strike those partnerships. And, and I think to really celebrate what you've done in terms of adapting the offering to suit those partnerships as well. So, you know, really well done in, in doing that. And as you say, I think for, for so many people watching this, this will be so interesting because the lessons you're sharing are really applicable to all sorts of businesses and, and all <laughs> sorts of sectors. So, so thank you for that. So much easier question now is, um, what's been some of the most rewarding parts of running our own business? Oh, that's easy. I, we have the most wonderful feedback and testimonials. And I love the people that we've trained. I mean, since 2007, we've had so many people come, come back again and again and again. Um, and we've got such a lovely, loyal customer base. And they share, they share the most incredible things that they've done. I mean, they are very brave, a lot of the, the people that, you know, they would have come on my course and then something will happen and they are able to, to use the skills that they've learned and, and quite often save a life. And you can't ask for, for something more powerful than that in terms of, of mm -hmm. feedback and, and sharing. So it's very humbling what people are able to do. And thankfully, people are really nice about letting us know. Um, yep. and sharing that information so that's what keeps us going the really lovely feedback that we have on a daily basis um, thank you to our trainers and thank you to you know the team here it, they, they are outstanding well various members of my family including myself we've all done your course and it's so good because it, I think it's so empowering it's one of those life skills that everybody should have in school everyone should have as an adult and because it's one of those things, it's like an insurance policy. You never know if you're going to, going to need it. We've got so many people joining us, um, some lovely comments. Here's a, uh, here's a question for you. Thank you so much for, for a comment. And then I've got one final question for you, Emma, because we don't want to take up too much of your day. Um, Emma, how do you cope with having people approach you for a training session and then asking for a proposal, but they never get back to you? That's life, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that is how it is. I tell you, though, a lot of the time, it is actually time that gets in the way. So if you have a robust CRM system, so a customer relations management tool of some sort, then getting back to them and reminding them in a nice way on a regular basis, you might need to wait a few months. So it might be that... For example, the person was in a supermarket and a child uh, in the trolley next to them started choking. And they saw that and thought, oh my goodness, I wouldn't know what to do if that happened. Mm. And then they sent me an email and I got back to them and then nothing happens. And then they carry on. And then they speak to someone else who said, you know what, I had a you know, terrible thing happen to me. And then it brings it back to them. And then maybe... Again, like I said before, you know, they, they are sitting there and one of my Facebook ads pops up or they hear this from Sarah and suddenly they think, oh, I was going to do that and I haven't been in touch. So I think don't give up on anyone until they tell you um, that they really don't want to hear you from you anymore, in which case, absolutely, we are not a spammers at all. But until they tell you they're not interested, then it might just be it's a timing issue. So don't give up on them and don't take it personally. Don't take any of this personally. I started off with 
all the local magazines that sort of contact you when they see a new business and they all tell you that they want you to advertise. And I started off and I was advertising left, right and centre until I actually measured it and realised that actually some of that was, was a complete waste of money. Some of it wasn't, but some of it was. So measure what you're spending your money in on, only use and do what has a return. So make sure you're doing it in a structured way rather than a scattergun approach. And the same with your customers. And we all know that actually the old Pareto theory of sort of 80% of your business will come from 20% of your customers is true. And it's true for any industry. So that 80% could convert and become one of the 20% in time. But at the moment, they're just out there. So don't get upset. Don't be frustrated. Just keep them on the back burner. And they'll either come to you or they won't. Really important advice. Now we've got a really good question that, um, that's come in. So what would your tips be for some emotional first aid for the elderly generation during COVID? And I think that is, thank you so much for sharing that. It's so relevant uh, right now. So, so Emma, over to you. It's a really difficult one. I mean, that's going from sort of practical business advice straight onto our sort of first aid advice. Uh, I mean, it's, it's connecting them. So it depends whether they are able to, you know, if they're able to use technology, then that has been fantastic. So we've had to teach my mother-in-law multiple times how to use her iPad that was this frightening thing that, that she had. Um, but now she can log into church. And when lockdown was eased, she forgot how to use it again. And now we've had to re-educate her to use it. And it's getting that link. And that link might be a neighbor. It might be you going and standing on the doorstep. It might be that she joins, they join your bubble. It might be that they can't. But I think um, getting that contact and allowing them to, to realize that you care and um, telephone calls. Um, we've got uh, the staysafe.support um, that we set up with AGK and ROSPA. And that's got some additional information. But I think loneliness is a real issue for older people. Uh, they may not even realize that they're lonely, um, but sometimes it's that lack of contact that we take for granted that we've suddenly lost in, in lockdown. Mm -hmm. And also vulnerability. Vulnerability both physically, but vulnerability to some really quite nasty scammers out there that um, can uh, have been having a field day at the moment, particularly during lockdown. So making sure that older people and, and people who are alone have access uh, and feel that they can approach you so that if they um, are feeling vulnerable or if they're being approached by someone and it doesn't feel quite right or even if they just want to sound something from you that they can pick up the phone and do that. So it's making sure that they feel included uh, and thinking of different ways to do that. Um, but that's a really good point, and I think I shall write a blog post on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. I'm very conscious we've taken up a lot of your time. For anyone that joined us during the course of this, the great news is we are going to share this to IGTV, and we'll be putting um, this onto the Really Help the Club website. So you'll be able to watch the, the entire um, interview um, at your leisure. Emma, thank you so much for sharing both your insights as a first aid expert. Um, you know, you have so much wealth of knowledge. I know there's so many other topics that, um, that we could cover. And, but also, I thank you for talking so candidly about your experience as a, as a business owner, starting up your business, some of the trials and obviously the, you know, the rewards of, of doing that. And I've just sort of jotted down a, a, few, a few sort of just, um, uh, snippets from what you've said, which I think are really just so relevant and, and so pertinent for anyone, you know, about being agile, uh, being prepared to outsource what you're not necessarily good at or don't feel a passion for. I love that, bury your ego. It's, you know, it's something that I think we all need a, a good reminder of um, from time to time. And being focused on your core values, which again has been really important during COVID, where each and every one of us has had to pivot our business to a you know, a greater or lesser extent, but, but to remain focused on your core values so that people know who you are and, and what you stand for. And of course, resilience, resilience, resilience. 
you know, for each and every one of us. So thank you so much, Emma. Thank you for joining us. Please do find the interview on the Really Helpful Club site and do go and visit Emma um, on the First Aid for Life site as well. And um, we look forward um, to connecting with you again. Lovely. Thank you so much. And yep, stay safe, everyone out there. It's strange old times. Thanks so much, Emma. Enjoy the rest of your day. And you. Bye.